The purpose of this space is to create a very safe environment for people to share a moment of their lives. Located one block north of St. Paul's Hospital, Downtown Denture Center features complete and partial teeth restoration options. With 35 years experience, Anthony Chung offers mobile services and emergency repair consultation 24 hours a day. Downtown Denture Center, just off Nelson at 970 Burrard in the lobby of the Electra Building. All the stories that you're going to hear tonight are personal in nature some of which can encroach on dark topics as addiction, abuse, self-harm, and you may get triggered by them. And if you do, there is a beautiful lounge to the back of XY that you can go down, chill out, get your composure. When you're ready, you can come and join us. So through this, uh, after I called on, on myself, what happened, the, on, what happened on the days that followed was Pretty amazing now that I'm paid attention to it. One of which, um, so, I, so I, Archangel happened, I had Sunday to go and relax, and then I catch an early morning train to Ottawa to go meet my men's group brothers that are out there. We hang out on, uh, that was on Monday, and then just before I was going to go to bed, he, he texts, hey, do you want to come join me for my birthday dinner tomorrow night? Well, I, I thought that was a rhetorical question, but I go, yeah, yeah, I'll have nothing else planned, so yes, I will join you. Not really understanding who else was going to be there. So I catch an Uber. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't understand how far IKEA was from where I was. Like, I just assumed it's relatively close like it is here in Vancouver. Well, that's the first bad assumption. The second bad assumption was Ottawa doesn't have any traffic. So, <laughs> so I called the Uber, and the Uber goes, oh, I have to get to Ikea. And he goes, when? I'm like, oh, in 20 minutes. He goes, said, uh, well, you're not going to get there in 20 minutes. This is Ottawa. I'm like, okay, it's Ottawa, then I'm not going to get there in 20 minutes. Please get me there as soon as you can. And off we go. He, and then, you know, standard conversation, where are you from? From Vancouver. We talk, I talk about the weather, how humid it is which then goes to cost of living. It's like, uh, then from cost of living, it went to, do you want to buy a house? What, why would you want to buy a house? And then it got really, then I, then I started just zoning out and m magic happened. And then he just started asking questions about, you know, what, what do you mean? why wouldn't you want a house? I'm like, well, do you want to spend 30 years of your life doing this and then finding out the next day you get hit by a bus and you're dead? Did you really enjoy 30 years of your life? Is there something else out there? Are you getting to a point where you actually ask yourself when you're doing your grind, is this it? Is this, my, is this what I'm meant to do for the rest of my life? And we had this conversation. And to be honest, I don't remember very much of this conversation. But I do remember when he dropped me off at the Ikea, he parked the car, I got out, he got out of his own vehicle and he gave me a hug and thanked me for this moment that I gave him. What happened then, well, well, the, well the, the voices in my head, you know, this is gonna be great when I look back at it like 20 years from now. When the voices in my head said, tell him that this isn't a coincidence, so I did. I go, look, uh, this, this didn't happen by chance. This was supposed to happen. And he goes, what do you mean? I asked for an Uber driver. I could have gotten any Uber driver. We could have talked about anything, spoke about anything. Then the conversation came to this, for me to tell you this, for you to get out of your car and give me a hug for thanking me for having this conversation with you. Is that truly random? 
or was this meant to happen? And I'll just leave you with that. And then he looked at my business card, put it in his pocket, smiled, and he went on his way. What happened shortly after that is I walked into the restaurant with my friend, and he introduced me to 10 shamans that were sitting around the table. I'm like, oh, this is kind of cool. <laughs> 10 different light workers. And now, OK, what he said to me was, there's going to be a bunch of light workers at, at the restaurant. What I thought was a bunch of like union guys <laughs> sitting there that put lights up. <laughs> like I actually didn't think that, you know, like why would he be hanging out with a bunch of shamans, right? Like it just didn't make any sense to me, but it turns out to be a bunch of shamans. And they, they all said the same thing. They said, wow, you're just glowing. What, what, what did you just do? I, I just had this conversation with an Uber driver. And again, uh, I got to share with them. And what I experienced then was fully embracing this gift that people told me that I have. And then when I look back at my trip, wherever I went, I, I, went, I turned from a 40-watt bulb to a 50-watt bulb, to an 80-watt bulb to a 100-watt bulb. And then at that point, I was just walking around, just glowing on everyone, totally unaware of what was happening. But everywhere I went, I was touching people. And by the end of that, I ended up inspiring three Uber drivers. So they, they might actually start their own competition to Uber one day and uh, shut them down. <laughs> but with that being said, our next speaker had to embrace her gift, and she fought with it for a very long time. And I invite Sudame to the stage to share her story. Good evening. The first time it happened, I was five. I was walking down the third floor hallway of the apartment building in our neighborhood, and I could hear someone behind me. I had a little panic for a moment, thinking, because I was five and I was scared. So I started to walk a little faster, and their pace matched mine. They started to quicken their pace. So sheer panic filled my entire body, and I started running for my life, and they were running after me. I ran down the hallway and then down the stairs, and then I took the second floor and tried to get the distance as much as I could to get away from them. And I, all I could think about was I was running for my life. As I got down to the ground floor, I could see the exit door, and I ran as fast as I could, and I gathered all my strength and courage and thought, if I could just get to the end of the hall, if I could just get through that door, I would be safe. And I ran faster than I've ever run before. I got to the exit and I pushed it open thinking I was going to be free and bam, there they were. I woke up in a big sweat and I'm terrified looking around realizing I was in my room. Same dream always ended the same way and I never saw who I was running from. Fast forward to 2005, I'm lying on the floor of a yoga therapy session and the psychotherapist is beside me encouraging me to explore my body and go into my body and feel the emotions that were there present. And I felt this terror rise up in me again. And I felt like I wanted to run for my life. So the therapist was like, imagine yourself running. And just as I gathered all my strength and courage and was about to run, just like I ran every other time in that dream, a force inside me said, no. Not this time. I'm done running. So she said, what do you want to do? I want to turn around and face it. I want to see what I'm running from. I'd never done that. So I took a deep breath. I gathered my courage, and I was about to face my biggest fear. And I turned around, and I started laughing. <laughs> and she's like, why are you laughing? I'm like, there's nothing there. I'm, I'm running from nothing. I'm like, oh my God, I've been running from nothing. And then it hit me. And I got really sad. And I realized I was running from me. I was running from my gift. I was running from this force that was in me, within me that was trying to come out. A force that was in me that was meant to be birthed through me. 
I was hiding this whole time. I was terrified to let it out. So it took me a while to embrace that because as an intuitive healer, as a child, I thought I was cursed. I would sit in a room and watch everybody. My nickname was Squeak. I was painfully shy and I wouldn't say a word. But I felt so much. I felt everyone's emotional pain. I felt their physical pain in my body as if it was my own. It was like these constant thorns coming at me in all these different directions, these messages I would get. It was confusing, it was painful, it was hard. It was hard to be me as a child. I grew up thinking I was cursed, being punished. And in order to numb it out, or my attempt to numb it out, I abused a lot of different things. I was anorexic for a long time. I was abusing food, then turned to alcohol, and turned to drugs, anything I could do to numb this pain. But none of that worked because that calling was so much bigger than me. That calling in my heart was so much stronger than anything else I could try. One day I was with a friend and she had this pain and I, I suddenly just saw it differently. I could feel it, I could sense it, but I saw it differently. And I said to her, I'm like, can I try something with you? She's like, yeah. So I'm like, close your eyes. So she closed her eyes and I literally saw her pain as an energy. And I reached in and I grabbed it and I pulled it out. And instantly her eyes popped open. She's like, what did you do? I'm like, oh crap. I thought I was in trouble. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, it's gone. I go, what's gone? She goes, my pain is gone. And in that moment, I realized I wasn't cursed. I wasn't being punished. What I was so afraid to let out was actually a gift. A gift for me, for my healing, but also for others. I suddenly saw that this calling that was so strong within me, this force that was trying its best to come out, just needed me to say yes. It just needed me to say yes to it. And ever since that moment when I said yes, the gift that's now coming through me has changed thousands of people's of lives, thousands of lives, including mine. We all have the potential to heal. We all have the potential to stand up stand out, stand strong, to own and embrace our own gifts. And when I did that, everything changed. Think of one person in your life that inspired you or changed your life. And we can think of, you know, Mother Teresa or Oprah or people like Martin Luther, Martin Luther King. We can think of those people, those people, but just think of one person in your life. So for me, I remember back to my counselor in high school. Her faith in me was such a gift. Her belief in me changed my life. What if she had said no to the gift she had as a counselor? What if she didn't embody her heart yes and follow that yes? My life would be different. I wouldn't have taken the courses I took. My life would have completely changed. I was going in a whole different direction because I didn't believe in myself. I didn't believe that this other path that she encouraged me to go on was possible for me. Never underestimate the power of yes. When you say yes to something, everything changes. When I said yes, to my heart, my calling, to my gift, and sharing and extending this gift and then empowering others to do the same, everything changed for me. I was not no longer looking at the no. I was no longer afraid and saying no to fear. I was saying yes to love. I was saying yes to my life, 
and to the expression and the gift that I was meant to extend. So today, tonight, I invite you all to explore what yes would look like, feel like, and the impact that it has potentially on your life and the life of everyone else. Thank you. Located one block north of St. Paul's Hospital, Downtown Denture Center features complete and partial teeth restoration options. With 35 years experience, Anthony Chung offers mobile services and emergency repair consultation 24 hours a day. Downtown Denture Center, just off Nelson at 970 Burrard in the lobby of the Electra Building. So, uh... To rewind a little bit, I'm going to remind all of you that I, I'm an expert at numbing myself. Uh, this past weekend, I went to my first cousin's son's wedding. I don't know what the mathematics of genealogy that is, so we're just going to call him my cousin. Throughout that event, I got to see—I got to see something I haven't seen in a while, because. Uh, I chose to stop drinking at the beginning of this year just to see just to see if I could do it. I walked up to my cousin and I said to him, "You're so lucky that uh, I stopped drinking this year. Your son is so lucky that I stopped drinking this year. Otherwise, uh, he wouldn't be dancing right now." And as I said that, I I looked at myself and I'm going, uh, "Why why is that? If I was half half my age, I could keep up with them. And if uh, a whole bunch of you think, well, wow, half your age, what, you'd be 17? I'm going to take that compliment because uh, you're, you're all wrong. But, uh, but for a good 20 years of my life, all I could do was sit there and, as other speakers who have taken the stage have also shared, they started with alcohol and then they started progressing to other things, to continually numb the voices, to numb the pain, to numb whatever it is that they're running away from. And it got to a point at May, th May 3rd, 2013, where I said enough was enough because I came home from an all night bender and I had to go and change my life. I had to do something or else I was gonna die. And then the transformation happened and it wasn't easy, but that was my turning point our next speaker also had a massive wake-up call as an event happened in his life to wake him up to make a choice. And I invite Craig Addy to the stage to share his story. So you'll see I have notes. It's not because I'm f afraid of forgetting. I'm afraid of saying too much. They're to keep me on track. <laughs> so my name is Craig Addy. And I've spoken before, and last time I spoke about my passion for music and art and creating beauty in the world. But this time I'm going to talk about a personal journey I had in health transformation. And it really started back in January of 2016 with a phone call from my parents, and it wasn't good news. My brother, at the age of 58, had just died of a massive heart attack. It was a wake-up call. I myself at that time was 65 pounds overweight. I thought I was okay. I mean, I hadn't smoked like my brother had smoked. And, but you know, it, was, uh, it got me thinking. And then, fast forward to May, I wake up one morning on a Friday, and I've got chest pains. And I freak out, thinking about my brother, thinking about I've never been this heavy in my life. I try to convince myself that there's nothing wrong. Finally, I tell a friend what's going on. She says, get yourself to the emergency. So I got myself to the emergency, St. Paul's. And they did this whole pile of tests. And I wasn't having a heart attack. It was indigestion. They gave me something for that. But I had to go back two days later to get a CAT scan. They were going to you know, do a picture of my heart and the coronary arteries. They inject you with this blue dye. And the news wasn't great. No, I wasn't having a heart attack, but I was on my way to one, and I had to do something. There was a 
20% blockage in one of my coronary arteries, which is not, they don't do anything about that. They don't do anything about that until it's like 80%. So I wasn't like about to have a heart attack, but it was like serious business. So two weeks later, I'm in the, uh, apparently I'm not using these. Uh, two weeks later, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm referred to a cardiologist, I'm in his office, and he's saying, okay, well, you've got to get your cholesterol down, so I'm going to recommend that you take a statin. It's a cholesterol-lowering drug. And I didn't want to do that. I had read about some of the side effects. I'm a professional pianist. It can result in cramping of your hands, foggy thinking. And I knew something that a lot of doctors didn't know, that you can actually reverse heart disease with a healthy diet. And so I said, I want to try this first. And he said, well, this isn't a marathon. It's not, this isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. You know, you have time to explore. So I said I wanted to do that. So synchronicity, I'm walking home, not from the actual appointment, but just like in, in those days from this place next to St. Paul's. It's called Mole Hill. Does anyone know Mole Hill? Well, in there, they've got these little public libraries. They're like little, they got these, there's a little sheltered, alcove and people put books that they've finished reading in there and I look in and there's this book called the China study and I'd heard about that book and it's about this very issue about using nutrition to heal yourself so I grabbed the book and I read it and it transformed my life I suddenly knew it was not only a slight possibility it was an absolute possibility so it recommends you know you do a whole food plant-based diet and I just dove in and I researched and read tons of books. I can't count how many books I've read now, but I found sources that I learned that I could trust. And in six months, I'd lost 45 pounds. And I was eating huge amounts of food. I was enjoying cooking. I was having a great time. I felt better than I'd felt in a decade. I looked better than I'd looked in a decade. And so it was time to go back and get the blood work done. So I went in, I was expecting to walk into the doctor, look what I did. And uh, the news wasn't so great. My cholesterol hadn't budged. In fact, it had gone up a little bit. I was devastated. Am I wrong? Is this all wrong? Well, luckily, I kind of listened to my body. I had never felt so great. You know, aches and pains I'd had for years had gone away. Massive indigestion was gone. I mean, no, something's right here. Trust that. And then I went to a community. There's a community of people that eat the way I'm eating. And I shared what had happened. And this, oh, well, my husband, it took a year before his cholesterol went down. So the doctor had given me the prescription. He was really adamant now. I didn't fill it. I says, I'm going to give this more time. And I reevaluated my diet. And I saw that, you know, there's some things I'm still eating too much of, like these really creamy nut sauces and stuff. And I know that you're supposed to cut the fat way down when you have this situation. So I, I brought that down. And I went in for another six months. But then I got frustrated because I still had another 10 pounds to lose before I was really in that safe zone, and it wasn't happening. I was stuck. And I was noticing that I was kind of binging on these. They were healthy foods, but I was still having these cravings and binging while I watched Netflix every night. You know the Netflix food thing? You know, it was like, you know, Ezekiel bread, which is super healthy with peanut, organic peanut butter and dried fruit. And then an email, more synchronicity, an email landed in my mailbox, and it was this thing called Bright Line Eating. And she had these videos, and I watched them, and I saw myself in these videos. She started talking about food addiction. So I decided to jump into this boot camp that they do. It's an eight-week thing, and try it out. And I got integrity in that. It gave me the power to say what I'm going to eat each day, and then actually do that. And I went 89 days straight without breaking my word. I mean, I had not had that power since I was a teenager. You know, I was a chocolate bar junkie from the first time I had a paper route. And um, <clears throat> I didn't lose 10 pounds. I lost 20 pounds. I was now 150 pounds, lighter than I'd ever been in my adult life. I thought I had it handled. I'm going along great. I'm in this maintenance plan. And it all ended with a piece of fudge. I was at my, my aunt's memorial down in Seattle, and my mom brought her fantastic fudge. <laughs> and it was my birthday in a week, and I says, I can have one piece of fudge. I had 12. <laughs> so we're laughing now, but I was actually devastated, because it's like I'd lost everything. 
And um, in the next month, it just set off a whole chain reaction. I was buying cookies and pastries at the coffee shops for a month. Gained seven pounds. I read this book called The Pleasure Trap. And I really got that I hadn't been owning that I have a sugar addiction, but it is real. I had a sugar addiction. For me, one piece of fudge, this moderation thing, it doesn't work. But I also learned that a sugar addiction isn't as bad as a cocaine addiction. If you can hold on long enough, you'll be free of it. And he said, usually in four days, you can tell that you're going to make it. So I said, OK, I'm going to do it four days. And at the four, end of four days, I knew I had it. And now I'm losing the weight. And so that's been my journey so far. And now I'm in the fitness realm. That's another whole story. And I've discovered the whole world of sleep. Oh my god. I read the book, Why We Sleep. Oh, it's a, that's another whole story. So what I've learned from this is that there's no end to this journey. You know, each time as I went along, I thought, this is it. This is it. This is it. Well, there's never end. But I did learn, you know, science really is powerful. It seems confusing. But I learned to research the research, who's behind that research, who's funding that research. There's vested interests that are manipulating it. So when you really get down below that, it is really clear, the pathway to health. So that's my story. Thank you so much. serving the Filipino community for the past four years. Whether you're looking for a minivan, car, truck, SUV, or a crossover, guaranteed financing available, I am here to help. Salamat po.